this is a very special occasion for us for the obvious reason of the content of the lecture, which is, uh, uh, as you will see, one of the most moving projects done by a most extraordinary artist and person that we had in the Indian art world ever. But it is also very special because Chaitanya Samrani is conducting this looking at this lecture and then conducting the discussion. Chaitanya is a very dear friend of ours. We knew him since he was a student in Baroda 30 years ago and have kept in close touch all of his time. And he comes about once a year but not always with long enough time to give talks. And now he has come and given five talks in Bombay, one in Baroda and some lectures at the Shunada University and this one lecture and we will now make sure that Jaitanya comes regularly and speaks in Delhi and gives us a sense of the kind of work, very extraordinary and diverse work that he is doing. <coughs> Jaitanya asked me not to introduce him in detail but I was determined to because there are many people here who may not actually have interacted with him since we've been away in Canberra at the Australian National University since 1999. Chaitanya Samrani studied, at his, studied art history at the Faculty of Fine Arts, MS University, Baroda, during 89 and 95. He taught at, Kien, at the School of Architecture, Trivia in Bombay in the mid-90s to the end of the 90s and went to Canberra, Australia for his PhD and has taught there ever since 1999. His scholarly work has been featured in conferences and publications internationally, including Australia, China, India, Indonesia, Singapore, UK, and USA. <coughs> Chaitanya's curatorial projects have been quite exceptional. The first, Edge of Desire, recent art in India, which spanned the period of 2004 to 2007 because it toured in Australia, USA, Mexico and India and several cities within these countries. It was supported by the Isha Society in New York and the Western, uh, uh, University of uh, uh, Western Australia at Perth. In 2010, he undertook a never before realized project with Chinese and Indian artists. Dialogue, dialoguing, extensive travel and tradition in Shanghai of the exhibition Place Time Play, Contemporary Art from the West Heavens to the Middle Kingdom, of which uh, Guy Tree just spoke uh, in a moment ago, so I'll not say more. And in 2012, he curated in Chennai to let the world in, narratives and beyond in contemporary Indian art. And this was accompanied by a series of research films with other people who were before. This, this, these research films are an archive of great importance and they've been shown several times in Delhi and in other cities, but they ought in fact to be part of a major archive and a record of a long period of uh, thinking and practice around the subject of narrative. In 2009, he curated a mid career survey of the work of Dao Australian artist, Saman Hari Mamabutan, and the title of the exhibition and his catalogue is All That Arises. Chaitanya is based, as I said, at the Centre of for Art History and Art Theory at the School of Art and Design at ANU, Canberra, where he teaches courses on modernism and contemporary art in India, India, Indonesia, China and Japan and on art and design and urbanity. In 2018, he initiated and taught ANU's inaugural in-country course on Indonesian art. And he also started work on an ongoing project which sounds extremely compelling and unusual, the wonders that Basham saw. You all know about the historian Basham. And uh, incidentally, Sun Wright was the mentor of Ramana Thapa, right? So this is an, an extraordinary 
project to undertake as an art historian, wonders that Basham saw, analyzing the visual archives of Professor Ian Basham, now in collaboration, now this, this project is in collaboration with colleagues at ANU, Canberra, the National Gallery of Australia, National University of Singapore, and the Ashmolean Museum, University of Oxford. Chaitanya is the primary author and editor of art, at, uh, sorry, of the book At Home in the World, The Art and Life of Kula Muhammad Sheikh, published in 2019 by Tulika Books in association with the Adolera Art Gallery. Besides his art historical theoretical essays, Chaitanya has written on several Indian artists, which includes Vivan, Ditesh, Nalini, Malani, Nirima Sheikh, Tatu, <coughs> and Tushar, who are all also uh, his, and some of them his uh, seniors and mentors, some of them his colleagues and friends. <coughs> his current research project is <coughs> much awaited so far as, for instance, I am concerned. It is titled International Affiliations and Cosmopolitan Aspirations, Art, Nation and World in India and Indonesia, with a special chapter on the comparison between the art schools of Bandung and Baroda, started within a year of each other. Chaitanya's language skills include a working knowledge of Bahasa, Indonesia. I want to mention these last two projects in a little bit, a little bit more, um, with a little bit more personal interest. Um, the book on Gulam Sheikh is extraordinary because he develops an art history based on empathy for the subject, while at the same time setting up a paradigm. So the book is in some ways a biography as well as it has a paradigmatic significance. It includes location, nationhood, and cosmopolitanism placed in a constellation within the contemporary and precisely to the life of a single artist. I'm also in great admiration of Chaitanya, Chaitanya's work in Asia. Chaitanya might be the only Indian art historian who is looking beyond also India, South Asia, and into the Southeast Asian, up to East Asian, um, uh, the East Asian countries and region. The, he started his research in Indonesia in 2004, and, and, and I've read some of these ongoing texts, and he treats it in a very uniquely um, art historical but also poetic way. The arch, arch, archipelago as a territorial challenge, as well as an allegorical possibility. Indonesia's Bantum history, non-aligned third world history, its nationalist cohesion or attempt at a nationalist cohesion as, as seen in the um, language project Mahasa Indonesia, and yet its continued investment in the ethnographic significance of numerous com communities. This gives him a kind of <coughs> historical and conceptual maneuver which we believe will be of great significance for our studies in India and South Asia. He deals with migration of people, of natives, <coughs> nationhood and cosmopolitanism, and marginality in national and international contexts. The talk on the extraordinary, today's talk on the extraordinary figure of Tushar Jok. They knew each other from 1993, became close friends in 1995, and Sharmila and the children, Katya and Kashyap were part of his family, as it were, in Bombay, as they grew up. Chaitanya and Tushar made a pair that must always have been explosive. I've known both of them quite well and over many years, both troubled souls, smoldering and mercurial, and both frankly wonderful. What a pair they must have been. We are fortunate indeed to have one speak, one speak about the other, and the other appearing to us in the guise of a splendid dream. I might get them to present. The ride to realization um, 
is a bit of a conceit that I hope will make itself clearer as I proceed. Um, it actually took him 54 days because on the 53rd day he reached the suburbs of Shanghai and it was on day 54 that he uh, arrived at Shanghai kilometer zero, bang in the center of um, old Shanghai, the art deco part of Shanghai. But how did he get there and why? This is what became Rochinante. This is a Royal Enfield Bullet Thunderbird. So 350 cc, 346 if you want to be precise, a single cylinder, four stroke, air cooled. I'm a motorcycle rider, by the way. I, I ride a, a largish BMW. Um, and so I, I, get, I get really quite enthusiastic about these things sometimes. Um, the strange thing is that it still carries a carburetor. It does not have fuel injection. And that has very important implications for high, alt for high altitude journeys, which I'll speak about in a second. Uh, it's uh, pitifully underpowered. Its max horsepower is only 19.8 uh, bhp. Uh, it carries about 20 liters of fuel. Real world consumption is about 20 kilometers per liter, giving it a theoretical range of plus minus 400 kilometers in one fill. Not very good. Um, five forward gears, ground clearance is very low, 135. Um, it has spoked wheels, which is great. And disc brakes and anti-skid braking system has been introduced, which is a godsend. Um, relatively low seat height, so very comfortable to ride. Um, and it weighs in at 195 kilos without the sidecar. With sidecar and Tushar's gear in it, Rochinante actually weighed close to 300 kilos. So it was a bit of a behemoth to maneuver around. Okay, this is Rochinante's route. This is what Rochinante and Tushar performed together. Um, through India, stopping at the Sardar Sarovar quite deliberately, through Nepal, crossing the border at Kodari, Zhangbu, um, and then across Tibet where he had to take a largest detour of about 1300 kilometers due to landslides so that extra northward leg that you're seeing over there he could have actually gone straight uh, towards the east but that was not possible. Um, it finally clocked at 9,624 9, kilometers. Uh, the altitude range was about zero, uh, Goregao, Bombay, um, about one meter above sea level to more than five kilometers above sea level. Yeah, so 5,261 meters was the highest altitude that he reached. Um, and that is quite something because it, you, you start getting really into thin air by then in all sorts of ways. Um, by my estimate, he would have consumed about 500 liters of petrol, about five liters of engine oil. I know that he went through four plus tires and tubes and a very large number of other bits and pieces. So during this odyssey, pilgrimage, Tushar traveled through cities, forests, farmlands, deserts, high mountain passes, frozen plateaus, and he made these two deliberate detours, um, the Three Gorges in China and the Sardar Sarovar in India. The quixotic foolhardiness of the enterprise is matched only by its momentous ambition in merging the journeys of Siddhartha Gautama, whom we know as the historical Buddha, and Ernesto Che Guevara. To enable First hand research into conditions that are submerged by nationalistic claims of prosperity and progress in the shape of mega dams. Tushar did not speak any Chinese or read. He navigated by map, hard copy, and compass, no GPS. The second half of the journey from the Nepal Tibet border to Shanghai was an exercise in sheer bravado and unflinching determination many would have given up long time ago. This presentation hopes to link together some of Zog's intentions into a discussion of 
what is ultimately endurance oriented performance art and the role of activism in contemporary cultural practice. Zog maintained a blog during his travels openly while in India and Nepal and then via proxy emails to his family after crossing into the People's Republic. He made 46 posts from start to finish. The blog and its accompanying photos come in as documentary evidence during my presentation. Towards the end, I will come to the sculptural installation that he produced during his two weeks stay in Shanghai by dismantling the motorcycle that had carried him across. In all of this, I am conscious of not trying to make Tushar into some kind of unrealistic superhuman figure. He was as mortal as any of us in this room. He was fallible. Like many of us, he was flawed. He could be fixated. He could be foolhardy. He was also fearless. Carrying a fulminating, fractured persona for all to see. Job's journeys, mobility, disappearance, and transmogrification. It's been an ongoing theme in his work since the middle of the 2000s, where he staged this durational performance called Looking for Flora, where the headless, decapitated image of the Flora Fountain goes looking for Om throughout the suburbs of Bombay. A refugee from the mania for renaming that accompanies our current right-wing neoliberalist neo politics. This kind of apparition and disappearance of the flora fountain made out of very um, kind of movie set type of material so it could be easily loaded up into a truck and taken to its next destination. Started in the northern suburbs and moved slowly southwards across the course of that day and night. Mobility was also a major concern in Tushar's foundation, if you like, of a single cell amoeba corporation, as he liked to describe it, unicell public works cell. One of its projects was the commuter attachment system of 2005. Um, the unicell website is now defunct, but I, I have some text from, from, from it um, taken while the site was still alive. And um, it produced a kind of tongue-in-cheek um, series of solutions to the problems that commuters in Bombay face on their hopelessly crowded, uncomfortable, and unsafe journeys. This commuter attachment system, which included various devices that could be vacuum adhered to the side of the train so you can hang off it, uh, like Spider-Man, um, they were presented as mock prototypes for production that could presumably produce a great deal of public benefit, tongue firmly in cheek. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll just actually manufacture like three million of these every year and, you know, Bombay's commuting woes and mobility problems will get much easier. Perfectly reasonable thing to do. The solutions that they represent are, of course, completely absurd and stopgap. Their promise of simplifying the daily challenges of rush hour is not so much that of comfort and safety, but of enhanced amenities for limpet-like clinging and extreme proximity with fellow uh, travelers. It takes, of course, no time for the viewer to realize that despite their cleverness, these devices or the movement patterns that he also devised, if you, if you get off um, on a station that is to the opposite end of the station that you got on at, what is the precise choreography that you need to follow in order to make 
the transition from one end or one side of the bogey to the other side of the bogey. It's a fine art that, that Bombayites have perfected over time. Uh, and as an, as an ex-Bombayite, I, I have great sympathy for this, this fine art of uh, hanging off trains. Um, he sought to mobilize highly charged literary strategy, strategies such as hyperbole and exaggeration and um, vidambana, criticism through humor, um, through, through his Unicell projects, where the viewer recognizes that what we are looking at is a lie. Obviously, it's a lie. But it, our recognition of the lie of it somehow forces a greater, more serious reckoning with the fact that this is actually a strange problem. I mean, we, we don't have to live like this. That it, 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 it doesn't have to be like this. That, that the situation as it exists is not okay. And this was something very, very important for Tushar. Just because the situation exists doesn't mean that it's okay for it to remain. So, Unicell's projects constantly improvised with ideas of mobility. With Venice of the East, this monocellular, single-desk, quasi-governmental conjob produced a kind of do-it-yourself regime of urban renewal or beautification. It is also with Venice of the East that we see in the middle of 2004-2005, um, Zog starts thinking about Shanghai and it comes up again and again. So there's a reason why I'm invoking this. Venice of the East was based in Bombay but it constantly invoked, oh, let's, let's make Bombay into Shanghai. That is, that is the future. Shanghai is the future. So in that sense, his journey on Rochinante from Bombay to Shanghai is also a journey from past into future. Tushar was CEO of Unicel. He was creative divisional manager. He was production cell supervisor. He was also installations in charge, in which guys he would wear blue overalls, like Prododezda of the um, Soviet avant-garde. All of these roles combined to produce a mythical project worth, you know, let's pick a number, 36,600 crores. Sounds all right, but a lot of zeros. It's a bit more than what a thousand crores a year, so uh, a day, so 36,600. Okay, let's go with that. And a Mumbai makeover so that we transform the city through a network of canals and make it into a Venice of the East. It would add Bombay's name to a long list of Asian cities, actually, if you think about it. Aleppo, Bangkok, Basra, Lijiang, Udaipur, all of these have at one time or the other been dubbed Venice of the East. They share the dubious distinction of having been dubbed at some point in history with this apparently glorifying name. The project basically consisted in delivering several thousand mock notices for eviction to people living in apartment blocks. So middle and upper middle class people were told that your house, your building, is in the way of our canal ways. You better move out. <clears throat> Please take this very seriously and we regret any inconvenience. So these letters were delivered and they invited people to um, you know, make contact. Uh, alternative rehabilitation sites are yet to be completed, but since the rains are fast approaching and schools are to reopen, we will try our best to accommodate you in one of the refugee camps. This is the kind of rhetoric that is often doled out to people who are not like us. Yeah. People who do not share our way of living, but this actually does happen to other people. So, his radical kind of um, 
undertaking of remodeling, if necessary through destructive means, the very intellectual fabric of smug middle class urbanity is something that um, remained with him. Um, and alongside this, something else that remained with him was a critique of the national goal of social transformation through infrastructural adjustment that has been part of state policy since independence. You engineer social transformation by making changes to physical infrastructure. This policy is founded on faith in ideas of progress and successive generations of political and administrative re leaders have designed and implemented strategies for the so-called greater common good. Even though the human cost has at times been severe, different kinds of social engineering with different degrees of compulsion have been characteristic of the nation state in the developing world. This is not a situation unique to India. The long cherished ideal of social engineering is based on faith in an essentially benevolent state apparatus that performs its actions not for the sake of power, but for the betterment of its citizens. That is the conceit of state-based social engineering projects. And so informal hawkers who often find the police truck coming and confiscating their means of livelihood, Unicel offered them these solutions. So your informal shop could become part of street furniture. It could collapse like a transformer from a science fiction movie into a post box and sit there innocuously until the authorities had gone away. Or your fruit shop could transform into a couch and become comfortable street furniture. Science fiction and comic books were very much part of his arsenal in advancing this critique of social engineering. And of course, as in the case of this, he also made sure that his art historical salutes were noted, this one being to Ambrogio Lorenzetti, the effects of good government, um, the Palazzo Publico in Siena, um, the Italian Trecento in the 14th century. Zorb would write quite beautifully at times. And this is one of his statements from UNICEL PWC. Art cannot on its own bring about societal changes, not without a political revolution. But an atmosphere conducive to such political revolution can only be created by the questions that are raised in the ideological and cultural sphere. Art is responsible for maintaining cultural continuity as well as providing raptures that bring a fresh outlook through its questioning of the present. And this questioning of the present and thinking what if and so what were really, really important for Tushar. So when he wrote to me after our initial fieldwork trips in India and and in China, um, during the West Heavens project in 2009, 2010. And he said, for the exhibition, I want to do a performance. And I'm going to ride from Bombay to Shanghai. And I said, Pagal ho gaya kya? You gone completely nuts. When was the last time you rode a motorcycle? It was 23 years ago at that time. And that was a kinetic Honda. A hundred cc twist and go. And so, you know, but he did it. He um, took riding lessons, got his motorcycle license, bought a motorcycle, got it engineered to carry a sidecar, and rode. Um, he was passionate about the right to land and the right to water, which are complementaries. One does not exist without the other. He was passionate about the fact that 
the world is in perilous shape and that the developmental ideologies of the nation state do not always serve it very well. Big dams were a particular target um, that, that Tushar wanted to think about very carefully. We are all aware of the problems that come up with submergence, with siltation, and in some cases, cases with geological instability as well. Strange thing is that this has a history that goes back to the late 19th century when hydroelectric power was seen as a miracle solution. Um, the Hoover Dam was built in 1935, the first mega dam in the world by the, UK, by the USA. Um, India's Sardar Sarovar project and China's Three Gorges projects are very much part of the ideology of the modernizing quote-unquote progressivist nation state. Uh, Tushar quotes the um, famous uh, temples of, um, of New India uh, statement by attributed to Nehru. And he says that his journey is a pilgrimage. Yeah? The end of that first paragraph. After saying temples of the resurgent India, he says, my journey is a pilgrimage from one such temple in India, the Sardar Sarovar project, to the Three Gorges Dam in China. It has references to the many travels that were undertaken by heroes and legendary figures, journeys that changed the course of their lives, the short journey of Siddhartha Gautama or the long journey of Che Guevara. He was not at all in doubt about the fact that this journey that he was he was embarking on was um, every every bit as quixotic uh, as it was heroic. Uh, but he was also aware that it was going to be a journey towards self-realization as well. This is from his um, own papers. The if you if you look at the slide carefully, uh, I don't know whether you can see, but on the my screen you can see where the folds in the paper are. Uh, this was part of his um, um, background research, which was voluminous. Um, he he studied the ideology of big dams in different parts of the world, um, and uh, it it's. Perhaps a little bit surprising that something like 35,000 big dams were built between 1950 and 1990 in different parts of the world. 35,000 mega projects like this. Many of the argued and promised development benefits of these projects, of course, never materialized. Today, there is an ongoing problem um, that has become the legacy of many of these big dams in different parts of the world. Um, Tushar made a series of important um, visits to villages in the Narmada Valley that had been affected by um, submergence or community displacement. Um, he made relationships of solidarity with the Narmada Bachao Andolan. Uh, those relationships had predated this particular journey, but they were renewed during this journey. Uh, all of the images that you're looking at have been taken from his blog. Um, yesterday, in the company of Katya, I was able to look at uh, his hard drive where high resolution images of these um, high resolution versions of these images are, are, are still there. So um, the, the book was mentioned earlier, so we, we actually have a lot of really important material um, which Katya and I looked at yesterday. Um, throughout um, the long running um, relationship with the Narmada agitation, Tushar produced a series of drawing works 
Um, these were, um, again, like the UNICEL solutions, the so-called solutions to urban problems. These were going to be solutions for the people whose livelihoods, forests, farmlands, homes, animals are being submerged by the big dam. So flotation devices and periscopes and various kinds of things. Um, these drawings were presented often in terms of a combination between sculptural installation and, um, and framed um, two-dimensional work. Um, and these drawings give evidence of a kind of constant searching, critical, sardonic, witty, and ultimately quite um, painful coming to terms with the realities of life in these submergence zones. Having uh, completed his detour to um, the Sardar Sarovar sites, he moved on through Madhya Pradesh and through UP uh, into Nepal. At a couple of locations, there were um, family reunions. This one was in Kathmandu. Um, Kashyap, are you here? I think he was five at the time, um, four, maybe four. Um, so the family came and met him in Kathmandu, um, and then the real fun started. Um, the, this was um, September, so the monsoon was um, still in sway, and there had been lots of landslides, including the mother of all landslides. Where is the road? It was a complete lunatic situation that he was trying to navigate through on his three-wheeled um, slow, slow, slow. And um, I don't know how, but he did make it across. He was held up at the crossing, the border uh, to Tibet, uh, because um, the voluminous paperwork that is required by the Chinese authorities. Um, single unescorted Indian man on a motorcycle going through Tibet did not seem to Chinese authorities to be a very good idea at the time. So um, he had to commit to travel through all of Tibet escorted. Uh, that was an essential uh, aspect of the permission that was given to him that he would always be escorted by a government-approved guide. And so three different government-approved guides accompanied him in their cars as he moved across the high plateaus. Um, along the way, of course, he had the opportunity to think about the third pole. Yeah, so we've got the North Pole and the South Pole, but the third pole is the Himalaya and the Tibetan Plateau. It contains the largest fresh water reserves anywhere in the world in the form of ice. And as it melts, thanks to human rot climate change, it is likely to produce an exceptionally disastrous series of outcomes for all of Southeast Asia, all of China, and all of India. So about 3 billion people will be affected by the demise of the third pole. And so he was able to observe the third pole and the canals that feed into the Brahmaputra, which comes through Bangladesh, into, to, to, comes through, through northeastern India and into Bangladesh. Um, this is a diagram of the third pole. That red boundary is what is described as the third pole. And so this became another kind of pilgrimage even though he had said at the beginning that Sardar Sarovar and the Three Gorges are the two important things. I think uh, as he traveled through Tibet, he came to realize more and more the importance of the Third Pole as well in terms of the dynamics and the political economy of water. Um, as I said before, uh, he went up to very pretty high altitudes, more than um, five and a quarter kilometers above sea level, like aeroplanes fly up there. 
Um, the fact that his motorcycle had a carburetor and not fuel injection meant that the thinner air made for an extra rich fuel mixture, um, which degraded the motorcycle's performance substantially. Tushar was also dressed in um, the kind of outdoor gear that he could buy in Bombay. Yeah. So, um, as you know, as someone who rides a, a motorcycle in Australia, it gets very, very cold. I am aware of the fact that the wind chill factor, especially on your face, on your feet, and on your hands on a motorcycle, can actually make the temperature a good twenty degrees below what the thermometer tells you. Yeah, it's called wind, wind chill factor, and it is absolutely killing. Yeah, I have experienced it. Um, his motorcycle did not have heated grips. All modern adventure motorcycles have heated grips because if you lose control of your hands, you're gone, finished. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was a cool, I've, I've reproduced some bits of the blog to give you an idea of the kinds of conditions that that he was going through. And at some point, I am able to see that altitude sickness is beginning to set in. Um, over here, he says that he has lost track of four and a half hours um, while he's riding. Fortunately, there is not much traffic up there. And so he, he is able to zone out in relative safety, relative safety only. Um, he also sees some of the beautiful high mountain lakes, uh, which are part of that very fragile ecosystem of the Third Pole, both saltwater and freshwater lakes in Tibet. Um, he is able to think about the entire history of Tibet as well, in terms of what has happened since 1959, especially. And over here, he catches a glimpse of the new train that links Lhasa to the rest of China. That train is pressurized because it travels so high that people cannot breathe very well. It's pressurized like an aeroplane. So he's up there, but just in the open air, losing track of how many hours he's been on the road. 140 kilometers in one day, yeah, 24th September. Only 140 kilometers. It seems only. Yeah? Um, and it has been raining. His waterproof clothing is not really waterproof. He is completely soaked. He is frozen solid. His face, fingers and toes are completely numb. All he can dream about is getting to the next stop and finding some hot water. And when he gets there, all they can offer him is a big thermos of hot water because the pipes have frozen. There is no running hot water. So it's, it's you know, extraordinary circumstances. And then appears on the 26th of September, the pillion rider. This fellow comes and sits behind him. And it's great fun. This pillion rider accompanies him through some of his most arduous journey. After we, went, after we left Lhasa, each day I feel has been more arduous than the earlier. My bones were aching with the cold, but I kept telling myself it was just a matter of a few hours. Each time I looked at the rearview mirror, I could see the face of my pillion rider, his eyes looking straight at mine. Without speaking, I asked him, how had you done this 1,600 years ago? And here I was complaining at every opportunity about the roads and the weather. But he does not answer childless questions. So his pillion rider actually turns out to be Shuansang, who had trekked on foot looking for the Tipitaka. Yeah. And his pillion rider instructs Tushar into the ways of time, to the cycles of time. It is 
all about timing, the pillion rider tells him. Just imagine if you had left three or four minutes before or after the time you left this morning, you would have met each vehicle, oncoming vehicle at the wrong spot. Like when you go to work in the morning on your way to the office. Sorry, Tushar interrupts him. I don't work. I am an artist. <laughs> All the artists in the room, please take note. The pillion driver tells him that there is a master cycle of time. There is a master cycle. Every rightly timed entry intersects with every other rightly timed entry in this master cycle. There are only a few times when one enters this master cycle, and that too by accident. But if you are in tune with the rhythm, then you can time every entry, entry accurately. Traffic is just an allegory. And now, imagine more than one master cycle, which also intersect. So you could ride from one master cycle to the other on your three-wheeled motorcycle. Tushar soon realized as he entered mainland China, as he exited Tibet, where he could still find some people who were familiar with India, that his absolute inability with the Chinese language was a huge handicap. No, you know, very often I've, I've met Indian friends who ask almost um, with affront, oh, why don't they speak English? And why should they? just because we do. Uh, and so he took to uh, asking the receptionist at whichever hotel he was staying at to write down on a sheet of paper the name of his next destination in Chinese characters. And he would stick that to his motorcycle tank or he would stick that to his sleeve. And then when he found himself getting lost, as I said, he's traveling just with you know, hard copy maps, no GPS. Every time he got lost, he would point, show me where, how do I get to this? Yeah. Um, traffic jams, of course, happened. And there's that fantastic photo of him taking a photo of the traffic jam, which we see later in some of the work that he produced subsequently. Um, as he got closer and closer to Shanghai, Rochinante started breaking down more and more often. It was not really built to take the rigors of what he was putting it through. And so spookless became a sort of repeated refrain. Spookless here, spookless there, spookless everywhere. When he reached the Three Gorges, um, his encounter with the Mega Dam was far more in the nature of a tourist's encounter, um, basically because he did not have those long-running relationships uh, that he did around the Sardar Sarovar, and of course he did not speak the language. Um, but he had already done substantial homework on the history of the Three Gorges that um, I know exists in the hard drive I mentioned earlier. Um, one of the um, rationale factors for the construction of the Three Gorges was that the Yangtze, uh, the Great River, would flood very frequently. And there was a disastrous flood in 1954, which wiped out the city of Wuhan, which you see over here. Um, the 1954 flood and the destruction of Wuhan became part of the rationale for controlling the river upstream near Sanduping. And that is the area that has been now flooded. The Three Gorges until recently was the largest dam in the world. Now the largest dam in the world is on the Brazil-Paraguay border. They've gone and built one bigger than this. Um, he noticed that the Three Gorges Dam was bigger in every respect than the Sardar Sarovar Dam. And he was aware of the relationship between the construction of the Three Gorges and the history of the People's Republic of China. Um, 
Mao's 1956 poem Swimming is recorded on the Wuhan flood monument, which was constructed in 1969, even though the flood was 15 years earlier. Um, those are the sites that are publicly accessible at the Three Gorges Dam, those viewpoints, A, B, C, D, E, and those are the ones that Tushar was actually able to visit. I want to take a little detour here to think about the river and its relationship to the history of the People's Republic. In 1966, Mao Zedong, who was at that time 72 years old and facing the specter of becoming irrelevant in Chinese politics, undertook a swim in the Yangtze. He was accompanied by his bodyguards. This swim reaffirmed his virility, that he was still a man to be reckoned with. And then he emerges and waves triumphantly in his bathrobe, etc., etc. The incident has been immortalized in a kind of history painting that you see over here by Tang Xiaohe. Uh, strife forward in wind and tides. It's uh, three meters wide, so it is very much the scale of a kind of history painting as we know it in art history. Um, the conquest of the river then becomes for the People's Republic of China and for Chairman Mao an absolutely essential ideological pursuit. That image was taken six days before Tushar was born, by the way. It's not intentional, it just happens to be. So six days before Tushar was born, Mao, Mao was swimming in the Yangtze. Um, a month after his swim in the Yangtze, which reaffirmed his virility and his relevance, Mao launched the Cultural Revolution. <coughs> so the implications of that conquest of the river are really very clear in what happens immediately after. The whole country goes red. And there's a 10-year period, 1966 to 1976, where tremendous transformation takes place, often in extremely violent conditions. <coughs> All of this Tushar had studied. He arrived into Shanghai on a barge crossing the Yangtze on the 12th of October. The last puncture was fixed. 13th of October, he reached the suburbs. And on the 14th, he reached Shanghai Kilometer Zero outside the Park Hotel. Um, that's us with one of our research assistants, Simon Shu, who had been helping Tushar throughout his transit through China. The next day, Tushar undertook the Ashwamedha. Rochinante was sacrificed for the realization of Kantaka. It seemed like the systematic sacrificial butchering of Rochinante was an absolutely necessary precondition for the realization of Kantaka. Not possible otherwise. So this brave steed becomes a bunch of abject objects throughout that butchering process which he did in a workshop on the outskirts of Shanghai. It was reassembled into a couple of troughs, one in the shape of a human being, the other in the shape of a horse. It was installed um, in this exhibition that has been spoken about earlier. This is Gigi and Atul, who are both in the audience, uh, who were also both part of that project, um, standing with Tushar during the install. The install took the shape of a big room, which was like the after scene, if you like, the after math of a mortuary operation. Everything that he had carried with him, um, including the used tires and tubes and broken spokes and bits and pieces of tools, uh, the overalls that he wore, his 
battered helmet with the cracked visor, all of these became part of the install, as well as the three big maps that you see over there on the wall, which is what he used for navigation. And so the man and the beast um, in their post um, mortal embrace um, greet the visitor. Um, these, these are the clothes that Tushar wore and um, again I'm, I'm just completely amazed um, as to how it was even possible to undertake something like this. Um, these are the labels that he wore on his sleeves or stuck to his fuel tank and these are the actual maps with which he was navigating. Three large hard copy maps. During the install process, I discovered Tushar took a few photographs of the bits of Rochinante that were submerged in this sludge of mixed oil and river from the Yangtze. Um, and these um, are quite amazing photographs in their own right, um, which bear thinking about also in terms of the nature of um, the beast when it has been reduced to abjection at the end of the journey. Directly opposite uh, Tushar's room, uh, we had the work of Chiu Zijie, who a few years ago had undertaken another kind of foolhardy quest. Uh, he said he was going to walk from Lhasa to Kathmandu. Um, <laughs> He didn't quite walk all the way, but um, that was that was the performance. Walking from Lhasa to Kathmandu, it was a tribute to um, a man called Nain Singh, who was um, a nineteenth-century surveyor in the uh, employ of the Imperial uh, Survey of India, the British Survey of India. Nain Singh and his companion pundits were all drilled to walk exactly 33 inches per stride. Uh, they traveled dressed as Buddhist pilgrims, hiding their survey instruments and in their robes and in their prayer wheels and so on. It was part of what's been described as one of the, you know, one of the great games where the Swiss, the Russians, the French, the British were all trying to uh, find an alternative route uh, into the sort of backyard of mainland China, not via the sea, but via overland. So Chiu Zijie's project made a really important counterpoint to, to, to Shars. And in this next section, I want to think about a few other uh, projects by artists from different Asian countries who have thought about this notion of traversal, this notion of migration and the foolhardy journey. So Chiu Zijie, made his journey wearing shackles which were 33 inches long so that he ended up with severely bruised ankles at the end of it uh, to mimic the 33 inch drilled step of Nine Singh. Um, and um, he commissioned these tankas uh, which are all mock tankas, they're not real tankas um, and they are all populated with cartoon characters from the history of Tibet, from the history of China, and from the history of India. Um, in the foreground are three pieces of um, railway uh, track that were made from melted down ritual vessels that he had bartered for during his walk in Tibet. So uh, now that, you know, the the, the train from Golmud to Lhasa is on, um, the next step logically is to link Lhasa to Kathmandu and, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative and so on that we have heard about in more recent years. Um, but this notion of um, traversal and abandonment through traversal is something that various other artists have also thought about and this is the work of the Korean artist Kim Soja, her Botari truck. Uh, again, she travels ostensibly on top of this truck, although I don't believe that in Korea the road rules will allow this. Uh, but she ostensibly travels on top of this truck, uh, which is laden with these pitiful bundles of cloth, the botari, um, which has been not only uh, a way of um, domestic kind of um, housekeeping in Korea, but has very important um, 
relationships to the history of the Korean War and the dispossession of people and the colonization by Japan, which lasted from 1910 to 1945. Uh, so the Botari is another of these sort of abject objects that speaks very eloquently about history. So Kim Soo-ja has produced uh, several other projects uh, using, using this metaphor as well. And thinking about the river, um, especially the third pole and um, what ensues from the third pole. Um, this is the work of the Chinese artist Yin Xuzhen, um, which is very much like a unison project if you think about it carefully. Uh, it's called Watching River. The river has become dirty, it's time to clean it. You know, So you freeze the river into blocks and uh, invite the entire village to come and watch the blocks. And slowly, slowly, slowly the river becomes clean. Um, or the project that Sun Dong has been uh, performing since 1995, where he writes his diary every day religiously with water. So that, you know, the trace is there, but it's never there as well. In 96, Sun Dong uh, performed this in Tibet, in the Lhasa River, uh, holding in his hands a wooden block um, of Chinese um, characters used for printing. He printed on the water, um, almost like you know. It's it's a it's a way of thinking about uh, the the fate of Tibetan culture um, in 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 the um, since 1959. Um, some of these collaborative projects um, by Zhang Huan have also dealt with the politics of water. So in, in a way, what I'm trying to sketch out is that Zog's project with the Sardar Sarovar, the Third Pool, and the Three Gorges is part of an ongoing series of artistic projects, very often manifested in terms of performance, um, that have a relationship with the political economy of water. And it is perhaps a truism only that um, you know, the, if, if last century's wars were about oil, this coming century's wars are going to be about water. This is again the work of Chiu Zijie, one of his more recent projects, um, in which he has undertaken a sort of mapping of the world, a global cartography. And um, this particular uh, work again emphasizes the politics of water. <clears throat> After the Rochinante uh, install, um, the theme stayed on in Tushar's work for several years. Um, he um, produced this monumental site-specific wall drawing um, in Poland um, in 2010. Um, which has very clear parallels to the experience of riding Rochinante and the realization of Kantaka. Uh, it features the figures of Jawaharlal Nehru. Um, this is a flattened out drawing um, stitched together by Tushar uh, out of various photographs. Figure of Jawaharlal Nehru and the fig figure of Mao. The Yamdrokso is um, one of the great um, high altitude lakes on the Tibetan plateau. And as the Yamdrokso ebbs, the sun rises. Um, the details that I've got over here uh, also feature these columns of uh, peasants that uh, Tushar devised, which would appear again and again through his work. Uh, Chinese ones as well as Indian ones, almost trying to uh, rescue themselves from inevitable submergence by climbing on each other's backs. This pair of drawings, um, also produced in 2011, um, speak about the ongoing sort of um, involvement that he developed with uh, the politics of water. And um, if you look carefully, um, Rochinante continues to appear time and time again as a little character, like a little comic book character that uh, traverses these torn landscapes and these destroyed lives. 
Um, some of the work that he produced subsequently was um, in the nature of photo photographic collage. Um, this reminds us of that, that photograph where he took an image of himself in the rear view mirror. Um, Tushar's career as an artist was not straightforward in any conventional sense. Um, as many of us know, he studied for his master's degree at the Faculty of Fine Arts in Baroda, finished in 1990. It was not until 2005, a full 15 years later, that Tushar had its first solo show. So it's, uh, it's usually not the case. Um, he was quite insistent that the self-affirmation of the solo show was not something to be chased for itself. The conditions had to be right and what he had to say had to be worthwhile and cogent in order for him to think about a solo show. He undertook residencies at the Canoria Center and at the Rikes Academy. He taught, he conducted workshops for students of art and architecture, participated in group exhibitions, dozens of them in India, England, Pakistan, Sweden, Cuba, Korea, Australia. The majority of these projects were built on a sense of shared purpose. The most famous of these is Open Circle, of course, which I won't go into today. He co-founded that with Sharmila and other, other artist colleagues in 1998. He remained relentless in his quest to exp expose the absurdity and venality of administrative machineries. He saw multinational capitalism and organs of some organs of the nation state working in tandem, complicit in global systems that pursued power and wealth through repression and dispossession. Throughout these myriad pursuits, relatively little was produced by way of commercially viable work. There's a very large amount of Tushar's work stored um, in Tushar and Sharmila's studio that I saw yesterday. Sparse sales of his work frequently amounted to a fraction of what might have been expected of an artist of his stature. Um, his artistic persona was that of a man possessed by forces that were way greater than himself and way greater than anyone else, these forces that possessed him. He could glow white hot with outrage and disgust at corruption and in injustice, even though he wanted always to remain fully engaged in the everyday, in his family, and in his children. This missionary zeal that he put forth sometimes went amiss in the contemporary art world. A large part of this contemporary art world, in Tushar's opinion, was built on hubris, grandstanding, and duplicity. Living and working in Noida and in Delhi since 2013, his work as an academic, as a teacher and mentor brought him into close community with a range of people, school children, school teachers, art students, activists, curators, fellow artists, dreamers chasing the possibility of a better world. He seemed always to be on the brink of the next big undertaking, wholly investing body and soul, plunging heedless of consequence into the next chasm that needed to be crossed. He was well aware that some of his pursuits were Icarian, but this did not stop him burning the candle at both ends. The conscience blazed bright, no matter how elusive utopia seemed. This is from Unicel again, written perhaps 15 years ago today. The utopia remains somewhere in the background of the whole endeavor it remains a malfunctioning effort. And with those words, I thank you. I knew that this talk would be 
rich and beautiful and <coughs> moving, and that it would be scholarly as Chaitanya, all Chaitanya's writing and presentations always are. But this is a, a range that he has covered today, which includes a homage to Tushar's realization, but in some ways also is a recapturing of what he ends with, which is a utopian possibility. And he does that both through Tushar and in some ways through his theorizing of it. Thank you very much, Chaitanya, for this beautiful, beautiful talk. We'll soon move to the discussion, but I had wanted to say a few words about Tushar, which I refrained from at the beginning when I started this session. I want to suggest that a few aspects of the kind of relationships that Tushar made with friends, colleagues, mentors, and students, and uh, it follows very naturally, in a sense, from what Chaitanya spoke. My relationship with Tushar was anomalous, anomalous. I was so much older, but he had some sort of an absurd faith that I was sufficiently sentient and understood something of his driven nature, his radicalism that bordered on nihilism. And this has come up again and again in Chaitanya's presentation. And his impulsion to go to the brink of which the Rosinante project is the peak. In one part, of, one part or the other of the globe, there was, he found a purpose, uh, and he worked uh, with uh, Majlis, for instance, to set up um, large projects in Kenya, in, uh, just remind me, where in Brazil? Uh, Bella Horizonte, yeah, and in uh, Bombay. And these were enormous projects of uh, multi various kinds of activities, researches, presentations, and so on. The Sardar Sarovar Dam on the Narvada that he had protested against with Medha Patka for many decades, and then the Three Gorges Dam, which you have heard about from Chaitanya, involved peoples and ecologies on a huge scale. The journey was the mission of a witness, in every respect a witness, always admitting that the witness act was itself not adequate enough. There was something of an existential game plan to always test himself, and, th that he had not, and the fact that he had not failed on this trip on Rosinante from Bombay to Shanghai this fabulation that he had dreamed up would have made him smile, recognizing his childish machismo a little sheepishly. And I can see that he would have as much wanted to fail as he might have wanted to succeed. While, he was, while it was a journey across an actual terrain of many perilous roads, as you have seen, where he would have, he says again and again in his blog, he would shout expletives to the wind and rain and mud. It showed him also the sublime, the mountains and lakes, and people living their daily lives. From West Heavens, which is what the Chinese called India, from West Heavens back to China, to Shanghai on the Pacific coast. He traveled, uh, Chaitanya, 10,000 miles? 9,624 kilometers. Oh. Kilometers, sorry. I shouldn't be speaking of miles here. To prove the value of his, and I think that Tushar, who hated Hubri, was full of Hubri himself of a kind. He traveled these kilometers to prove the value of his Hubri and wore no shining ar armor before or after that. Childish machismo to polish his Hubri into a gleaming armor and then to retreat into complete and utter doubt, which I think was the mainstay 
of his soul. Chaitanya ended with his words, and I would like to do the same to repeat the words. Though utopia remains somewhat in the background of the whole endeavor, it remains a malfunctioning effort. And in some senses, he had devised Rosinante to be a malfunctioning machine which stood by him and saw him through. The floor is open for questions, and we might have a longer response in the beginning and then shorter questions as you would like. We can have, I mean, we don't just have to have questions. We can have responses and comments. Chaitanya, please. Ashish Rajadaksh, uh, who happens to be here very fortunately from his. Um, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Vishar. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Sushar, also, uh, and, and Gita. Um, I think, you know, I mean, the, the, there's, there's lots to say, uh, and there are lots of questions, lots of suggestions, lots of ideas, uh, some of which we will carry on in this conversation, but I hope we will take it forward in other, other conversations as well. And Sushar becomes a kind of a, a signifier for various other conversations, which I suspect that work will probably be able. So uh, I... Um, read the blog uh, almost continuously actually over the last two days. I had not had the occasion to, to, to engage with it earlier. And uh, while I cannot claim to be something of an authority on Tushar's work, I did think, I, I've always seen him and the way you've shown him also as a political figure. I did, I did see the blog in a curiously, you know, as a curiously sort of um, innocent and factual blog uh, startlingly absent of politics. Um, it, it, it doesn't actually deal with politics. And to the extent it deals with politics, it's a peculiarly kind of Nehruvian frame within which he has chosen to cast this. And you also sort of referred to it again and again. Now, that particular Nehruvian frame, I mean, begins this thing by quoting Nehru. He then goes to Anand Bhavan. He then has the Sarda Sarovar. And he even quotes, uh, f frames the Narmada debate uh, within the Nehruvian developmentalist ideology, which is not necessarily, I suppose, how he would have always framed it. You know, uh, the Sadasa is also actually questioning that. The, it's, it's, it's often at, at tension with that. Um, and then he goes through Tibet, and there's zero mention of Tibetan politics. Now, the one thing you would have thought is Tibet uh, is, is, is an astonishingly complex space. Uh, and, and then, of course, goes into China. And it is, it is at the China end of it that I really want to pose my, my question to you. Um, the, the question is primarily the same word, problematizing China. Okay, um, It's astonishing that this work was done in 2012 because literally it seems that in the last, what, uh, in eight years, things have changed so dramatically vis-a-vis -vis China that I doubt very much if you could have done this today. It, it, it seems inconceivable to me that they would have actually let him do it. The, the extent of crackdown is, is quite um, uh, astonishing. But more than that, there is another kind of problem that seems to be emerging, which I think we in India ought to be especially aware of. And that is that, I, I put it to you, that the that, that, that Chinese modernity, in the way that more and more debate has come up, I'm thinking of Wang Hui's work really about modern Chinese thought, doesn't map India's. And China's own framing of things like these gigantic infrastructure projects are not those of India. Nor indeed, astonishingly, is China's theory of the nation similar to India's. And only now, I think, has the problem of Chinese nationalism and the crisis of Chinese nationalism attached to Chinese modernity in the way that Donald Trump will tell China that human rights means this, that, and the other, you have to do this, that, and the other, we will certify that this is that this is what it means without China having any similar ethical basis on which to critique the West. Uh, you know, there, there is a certain sort of a crisis that seems to be emerging, which may allow us in hindsight to read Tushar with the degree of irony that arguably his work possesses, but which the blog doesn't. Um, you know, so you have mentioned repeatedly the use of irony. I want to just suggest that in conclusion, uh, just one possibility in which how this might be done. Um, you mentioned time 
uh, you know, you mentioned this, this fellow sitting behind him and so this whole time question. I think that the whole idea of, you know, the Foucauldian heterotopia, you know, this idea of regimes of multiple temporalities is, is a way that we might be able to take this forward. Because I think that there is a real problem here. And I think there is a certain, let's say, Indian conceit here where we believe that just that, that they should speak English, but we also believe that we think we know China. Like the world thinks it knows China, you know, and, and you have books and books and books telling you about what China is all about and so on. But only now I think getting a sense of where the problem is arising. Uh, you know, the, the problem of the enlightenment, the problem of a kind of a state sanctioned ethical basis of modernity, the role of empire in that you mentioned one belt, one road, and the kind of structure of these infrastructure projects. So I want to really ask you in 2019. Almost as to whether we, we might be able to look at Tushar's work as, as almost presciently saying something or not saying something, or is it actually out of alignment with the kind of political crises that we are currently facing uh, with, with China? Uh, thank you, Ashish. I think you're absolutely right in observing that it would probably not be possible for him to undertake this journey today. It would not necessarily eventuate like this. Um, the fact that it happened at all in 2010, it took a lot of doing. Um, getting him the necessary permissions to ride across Tibet was a really, really grueling task. And uh, had it not been for the tremendous acumen and persistence of our project manager Chen Yun, um, it would not have taken place. It was um, really, really quite dicey. Um, he, he did get held up um, at Kodari, at the border, um, not allowed to cross into Jhangmu on the Tibetan side um, for lack of paperwork for a couple of days. Um, and as I said, he was escorted yeah, by uh, approved travel guides uh, through Tibet. The blog is really quite deceptive to my reading about what's actually taking place um, when he is in Tibet. He is not allowed to blog. He is emailing every day um, text and images to Sharmila, who's uploading it onto the blog. So um, he's, he's going into these cyber cafes um, you know, and he doesn't know how to find a cyber cafe. Someone has to show him how to find a cyber cafe. Um, and he is working very, very quickly um, and always trying to remain quite deliberately apolitical in what he is saying. Because I think he is very well aware of the circumstances within which he is traveling. And the fact that he is being escorted, the fact that email communication in the People's Republic is even less secure than any other place um, and I think he's making a quite deliberate decision to remain aloof from politics during that um, uh, transit across the third pole. So um, the fact that politics is conspicuously absent is actually also indicative of the kinds of conditions that he's observing at that time. Um, I haven't had a chance to read at any length the um, various documents that he um, uh, wrote both before and after the journey, um, but from the titles of the files I know that they contain um, uh, quite systematic um, research into the politics of water in the People's Republic. And so uh, that that's that's task that needs yet to be done, and um, I'm hoping to get into it at some point. Um, so his 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 apparently apolitical position while he's actually on the ground in Tibet is probably, to my mind, uh, a way of ensuring that his journey can be seen through to completion. Was that he did not send him 
Okay, yeah. He, had, he, he composed, composed it and left it in the draft. Exactly. It was only the draft, so it was not even sent. Hmm. And I would sort of, you know, open the yeah. AM here or wherever I was, and then I would put it on the draft. Hmm. Because the moment he entered the bit, he couldn't access his name. Yeah. And he was very much aware of it. And, hmm. and yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chaitanya. Extraordinary presentation, and I'm in deep, deep awe of this work. But my question is about the telling or the narration of this work. And I was quite curious about um, the, the form of telling centering around, around this individual, let's not forget, male figure traversing this landscape. And I'm very curious how this sort of reproduces a certain kind of uh, narration of this modern heroic feat, um, that you know, the arrow of time is practically being ridden on by uh, the modern artist. And um, clearly, in the narration of this, even as you answer questions, there's an entire like, large, scattered paraphernalia that keeps changing with different geopolitical conditions. There's also a very large set of people that also accompany in this journey. And how does one then maybe retell or narrate this that sort of captures, in essence, his own critique to, to the Hebrew in the contemporary art world that, that encapsulates, embraces um, all of these agents, and then in which he probably is not the rider of the bike, but the bike is riding him, sort of thing. That, you know, you, it, he was the medium to tell the story of Rocinante. Rocinante might be the protagonist. Uh, in this to tell a certain political journey about a certain um, emergence of a road um, that we see emerging in a very even stronger way right now. And I mean, uh, even the the project of walking, uh, Okri Ondozor had talked about this in his archive fever of those monks riding with those 33 centimeter sort of thing. So traversing then be becoming a collective project. And how does one map that sort of collectivity in this journey and perhaps avoid the, the, the trap of the singular uh, heroic journey that is being taken. And I think we're part of this retelling of many historical moments right now because of the way American triumphalism constantly posited the singular figure <coughs> as the, the individual agent of all of this. So, so perhaps as a way of all of us to rethink these tellings of, of projects such as these. Yeah, thank you, Sabi. Um, I, I think, you know, Kantaka, the horse of Siddhartha Gautama, dies of a broken heart because the prince leaves and goes into the forest. In the legend of the Buddha, Kantaka dies of a broken heart. So what does he realize? What is the realization? Um, in this particular story, Rochinante is slaughtered in order to become Kanthaka. Um, I think that the masculinity, the virility, in fact, that is implicit in Tushar's endeavor um, is absolutely essential to recognize. And I'm glad that you do. Um, it is paralleled by the masculinity of Chiu Zijie, who dons his 33-inch shackles and tries to recreate the journey of Nain Singh. And he also, in Chiu Zijie's installation, in fact, um, the maps that were displayed uh, included not only the journeys of Nain Singh and his compatriots and his comrades uh, working in the service of the Imperial Survey, but also various other journeys undertaken by Russian, Swiss, and French adventurers who were all trying to find a way into the back door of mainland China, basically. Not come in via Canton, not via Guangzhou, but surprise them, basically. So, so as, as you, you, you're quite right in that there is, there is an entire archive of these crossings. And Tushar is, I think, aware of these previous crossings or attempts at crossings. And 
I think he's quite self-consciously mocking his own foolhardy, quixotic ride when he decides that I'm going to call this thing Rochinante, which is the name of Don Quixote's mule on which he tilted at the windmills. You know, so I think that 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 irony and that laughing at himself is implicit in the very titling of the beast to begin with, and then it's. You know, and you know, it, it, it's almost like it's a necessary condition that Rochinante needs to be butchered, that the horse needs to be sacrificed at the end of the conquest, in order for Kantaka to reach realization. That you died of a broken heart because this man left. What were you thinking? Is expressed in very uh, existential and romantic terms. And if I can say that consciously or unconsciously, dismantling of it and laying it out is actually becomes a contemporary work of art. Just as has been said, the archive, the, the photocopy becomes the work of art. So it is like from Joseph Boys onwards, it becomes a contemporary work of art. And that image that is left, you know, lives the previous history to then the future articulation about it in the context of installation art, the fragment. Uh, I want to ask Chaitanya, because you use the word butcher, butchering the beast. Did he see that as a, an aggressive act or he saw it as the, uh, as, um, uh, as in one sense what Vivan is saying as uh, the necessary uh, denouement of his, own, uh, of his own journey into finally what he also is, he says in the, in the, in the blog, I'm an artist. And that what he does is a, he then produces a material object in its fragment and in its abject form, but also in its possible regeneration into another kind of life, that this is a much more positive act than is being suggested. And I think Vivan is saying that, and I would have seen that uh, installation as, a, as, a, as an affirmation of the machine, of, of him and the, of the relationship between him and the machine becoming, then gaining another life. Mm -hmm. Uh, why, why do you see that as, as violence? Um, if I can just bring those images back. When, when this process was taking place in a workshop on the outskirts of Shanghai, um, Tushar was keen not to have any of his colleagues accompany him. Oh, I see. He, uh, I asked him many times <laughs> to um, go with him and he said, no, 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 it's very far away and it's a very uncomfortable and dirty place. I don't want you to come. Several of us were in Shanghai at the time. None of us was present at the uh, Ashwamedha. He refused okay. to allow, uh, allow it. Um, when, you, when, you look, when you look especially at the image on the top right of the screen, um, the guts have been spilled. Um, there is a pool of congealed machine oil um, underneath the skeleton. Uh, it is very much like a disembowelment that has taken place, um, to my mind. These are photographs that he has taken himself. Uh, he does not um, um, actually do the dismantling. Um, the workshop crew do it under his direction. Um, and and so to 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 me it seems very much like a, a slaughterhouse operation. Uh, I was really quite distraught because um, uh, after arriving in Shanghai, he said, "I'm I'm going to break it apart." I said, "Q, I mean, come on, my God, it's carried you all this way. Um, can't you do something else?" He said, "No." He, he was determined that he was going to, you know, tear it apart and, and make this. 
Um, no amount of argument is going to sway him. Uh, Sharmila now points out that he already had it in mind when he set out. I didn't know. Yeah. He did buy only a one-way one way ticket. Um, um, and Rochinante was not going to come back. But the fact that it was going to get dismantled in this brutal fashion, I didn't know. Um, incidentally, he also arrived in Shanghai uh, the day his visa expired. And then he spent the next two weeks, um, 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 you know, we would, we would sometimes smuggle him into the hotel um, after the staff had gone a bit sleepy uh, because he was, he was in, in Shanghai illegally for a couple of weeks, uh, which, was, which was great fun. At the time, it wasn't great fun at all. Um, yeah, but I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, it, 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 it's just something that I um, have construed it as. Uh, I may be wrong, of course, but uh, that's, that's how it seems to me to be. In fact, the bolts are all open, and theoretically, this could all be put back again. If you use the word slow, just let me finish. If you use the word slaughtering, then there are hexaws. Did he cut the parts into into? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah. there is no there is conceivable no. way that Rochinante could have been made whole again. Okay. Because By the time they were finished, it was it was you know it was really quite final. Right. He yeah. did use a hexo and cut. No, no, no. And you know, machine okay. parts were machine parts were completely yeah. So you can actually when when you look at the detailed photographs of the install, you can see that you know there's no conceivable way that this could be repaired. Um, the frame was cut by hexo. Um, uh, things were separated from each other. Different components of the motorcycle were separated from each other with absolutely no regard for um, um, any possible recuperation. So just to complete one part of my thing, that this dismantling and this presentation, potentially, one could say that this is a historical a aspect or uh, uh, exhibited thing of a major example of installation art. Sure. In India, I don't know whether we have a museum that would have the courage to buy such an installation art, unless the forces of articulation and art history say now, you museum, you're behind. This should be presented as well. Sure. We're still behind. Of course. Geology or museum practice. Yeah. Art, art practice yeah. always exceeds yeah. the limitations of institutional practice. Um, and that I suppose we should be grateful for the fact that art practice does exceed the limits of institutional practice. Otherwise, we'd be in a very sorry world. There's a question here. Thank you. And it's a pact, and I think the fact that he made this pact with the machine, um, and and the machine saw him through, the pact would be that. Uh, that there's a sacrifice in some ways. Yeah, it is systematic. It is systematic. It's like an operation in a workshop. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions or responses? We don't, yeah, but. Why is this, this uh, you know, every bit of performance art these days is filmed from the minute it starts, you know, to the moment it ends, whether it's 24 hours of Nikhil Chopra or whatever it is. 
So how is it that this trip was not filmed? I or it would have made such a fabulous uh, documentary as well. Uh, it would have been physically impossible to do so. And, and you but know... Did you think about it? Um, no, because um, it was hard enough to get him solo across, uh, leave alone a film crew, and we had, we had no money for that kind of expense either. Um, but uh, to, to, to take a film crew through Tibet, uh, it's, it's another, another, another kind of negotiation, another level of negotiation that um, we were not able to support at all. Yeah. I want to ask you about the question of doubt, mm. uh, which is what you and Gita have brought up. Uh, there seems to be um, the element of affirmation through the masculine um, heroisms and the conflation of these heroisms, Ashwamedh and its long history, uh, Che Guevara, Mao Zedong, um, Kanthak. So these are probably, you know, these are, it spans a great, uh, there's a great historic span and there is a great, um, there are acts of resistance and also great acts of violence which are embedded into these histories. Um, in the case of the narrative, these come forward as acts of affirmation. Uh, I'm interested in the cynicism and the sardonic element which you use through the Unicell project, which seem to represent an entirely different attitude I'm, I'm interested in asking you, what is the, how do you read this singular solitary act and its heroic, and as Sadi talks about its, um, its machismo as well, in comparison to the collectivism and the faith that we would have reposed in the open circle, other kinds of collective projects, the Narbada resistance, etc. Surely these were embedded in a great amount of collective faith. Whereas here, we are talking about dispersal, dissipation, destruction. Um, thank you, Gayatri. Um, I think there is a clue in, um, in the last sentence of his artist statement that he produced for the catalog. He says that rather than being a, a journey from point A to point B, this is a journey towards myself. And he, he, he ends on that very, very carefully, I think. To, to put his own kind of quest for realization front and center in our minds. Uh, in, in a way, the realization of Kanthaka is also the realization of Tushar Zog. Um, and so the, the masculinity that is inherent over here, I mean, of course, there is a question here. Could, could we, could we, could we um, think about um, this kind of journey and the networks of journeys that you have referred to, that Sabi has referred to. Um, if, if we think about them in, in historical terms, then the vast majority of them have been produced by persons of the masculine gender. Um, they, they all almost always involve traversal into territory that is not one's own leaving one's familiar environment and going into someone else's place it's 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 it, it's a it's a it's a um, it's a tendency that is you know written large across the ramayana it is written into the mahabharata it is really written into a large number of the world's legends and it is in fact one of the sort of foundational conceits of patriarchal history writing that you know, it is it is this this kind of traversal and and this penetration of the territory of the other is a peculiarly masculine activity. Um, um, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I've heard many narrative where artists or art practitioners talk talks about their friends, but this is the more like this is the again to. Remember it, it is the best uh, narrative I heard. One person is talking about his friend. And I think like, this is how artists should talk about their friend. But this is 
the very point uh, I have some problem with, and that is, I, I have, because in your talk there is an element which is personal, which was, which was also private to you. The way Sarmila narrates, there is a private element to that. The way Gita also talks, there is a personal relationship. That's on the underline. I have not spent so much time with Tushar, so I can't claim so much. But I have, whatever time I have spent, like smoking out of the uh, outside the gallery, up to the talk and all, I never felt he was a great man. And that is his greatness. He never let you feel he is great. He is, except his physical beauty. That's, I think, a lot of people admire, a lot of people have crossed like, on, on that, which he could not hide it. Otherwise, he hides everything. If you ask a secret, he will wonder his four pockets. No? Short and pant, and then he will give, he will never say no, and there is a constant smile. There is ease to be with him. There are many artists in our generation, I mean, including senior to younger than me, uh, there is a very difficult moment to talk to an artist who, who is saying hi to whom first time, or you are saying hello, or you are giving smile. It's very complicated. It's very hierarchical. I never faced that with you, sir. But today, when I heard your narrative, it makes me very uncomfortable because this is the to say the, the heroic version I never saw. I, I knew the, this work. I saw this exhibition in the Art Gallery long back when I was new to Delhi. But today, this is this is a Tusa I, know, I, I don't connect to. You push him to a stage, it, maybe in a theater somewhere. I don't know if I'll be able to be there in that stage, which makes me inferior. I always, like before, I used to envy him. Now I feel very small in front of him, which I don't like. So my question is, are we talking about a dead artist and trying to immortalize, immortalize him? Or are we talking about a young artist? I assume maybe he still is al still alive in our brains, in our like heads somewhere, and trying to make to trying to keep him young forever. So my question is about that. I don't in your present. Are you trying to immortalize, or are you trying to keep him young forever? Okay, um, let me answer you in two ways. Uh, one is that. Um, what he attempted uh, during the um, August and September of 2010, um, even a very seasoned adventure motorcycle rider would not attempt. Okay, It is actually a really, really weird, way far out dangerous thing to do. Uh, can you can you can you can you telling on that point that nobody can, can do it? Would you That's like would you like to would you like to hear me out? Thank you. Um, so at one level, the endeavor is extraordinary in just its physical undertaking. Okay, um, I cannot undo the fact that he traveled nine hundred nine thousand six hundred and twenty four kilometers going as high as 5,200 meters, um, that, is, that is what he did. You have to recognize the fact that he undertook an extraordinary journey. There is no way that acknowledging the extraordinariness of that journey should violate any preconception that you might have about who Tushar was and what he stood for, for you. Okay? So, you have to acknowledge the fact that what he pulled off was in any book extraordinary. And with a poverty of technology and a poverty of equipment that is flabbergasting. Okay? So, I'm sorry that it does not occur very nicely in terms of what you would like to think about Tushar as being, but this is what he did. I cannot undo it. And I cannot not tell that story. It is part of his work. Okay? I have not made anything up over here. 
this is actually what he attempted to do and he pulled it off. Okay. The fact that he is no longer breathing here with us and the fact that his life, his breathing stopped when he was 52 and a bit, I cannot undo that either. Nor do I wish to. So perhaps you might want to think about it a little bit further. Yeah, He was 52 when he died. He was in the prime of his life. He was young still. What do you want me to do? Make him old? Chaitanya. Myself, I'm Savi Savarkar. Yes, I know. Yeah. Uh, I made long back. My show was there in Ravindra Bhavan in 2008. I made first time to Dushar. And he pointed out the, some of this, my work of, on the Devdasis. He asked me, Savi, have you traveled there? I said, yes. I was with the state with the Devdasis. I work, I deal with the social issues. He asked me another question. It is this traveling is helping to you? Mm. Yes, of course, this is my ethnographical approach coming. And I'm very much concerned with that. My discussion started with him and uh, we had half an hour together. Now I'm realizing, because after that I haven't met him. But do you have any, any program or any kind of things to extend the, such kind of works in the form of written, in the form of any kind of written for the new generation, which is required in the academic and the professional also. Have you have the, some such kind of plan and something to that? It will great help for the academics today. Um, I, 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 I earn my living by teaching. Uh, I'm a full-time teacher, yeah. Um, but also what has been mentioned earlier is that um, the SSAF Tulika uh, book about this project, it might become a way for other people to continue to think about their own practice as well. I think, Savi, you emphasize something about the journey, that he asked you, do you journey there? I think you were wanting to make that as a, a, as, as a kind of incipient quest in him, which was much, much before uh, any of this or, or any journey, but certainly this journey could have been conceived. So were you trying to say that he was somewhere asking for that traversal, that because um, now, now I, I gather that yeah. after the presentation of Chaitanya, yeah. you know, I connected with Chaitanya. Yeah. Yeah. There was a gap. There was a big gap. Yeah. yeah. For some, some reason, Shamila called me for some presentation. Something like that. <coughs> I, and then I came to know that Shamila is one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we are all content with the, uh, I, may I just say, uh, may I take uh, just the little prerogative of being in the chair? I think that the first uh, question, or no, the, the, the extended response that Ashish gave, Chaitanya, to the fact that this appears so non-political, and his blog, I mean, the journey has a political motif to it, which has to do with his, uh, his obsessional relationship to the Narvada project, to uh, his what he always spoke so lovingly is Medatai, and uh, and then the extension of it to Three Gorges because the exhibition happened to be in Shanghai and he made that um, historical and uh, not he made it into a historical journey within the contemporary because Three Gorges Dam is was at that time the biggest, but I think that the the question of why that blog appears to be uh, so um, matter of fact humorsome and uh, quotidian is one could be that he had to uh, guard himself against uh, surveillance.
But I think there is something else there. And I wish that you would slightly probe that at the end. There is something else there. This everydayness that he records is a mode of diary writing for, for one thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's almost like, you know, they, this is one way that one might write a journal. That is one part of it. The other is that he's investing something in the, in the mechanics of this ride, the, the mechanical relationship of himself with this, this vehicle, which is standing in allegorically for other things. Yeah. Uh, but even so, there is a residue where we have to address the fact that for so motivatedly political an artist, this journey is finally, in his own words, self-realization. So I think there is a kind of enigma here that perhaps we may address even briefly or keep it for the future to address in your book, don't you think? Sure. Um, one thing that I, I, I would like to note over here is, um, um, and, and this is also interesting in terms of the earlier discussion around masculinity and virility, is that uh, by the time he crosses from Tibet into Qinghai, he is exhausted. He is just putting one foot in front of the next. He has to complete the journey. He is determined to do that. The exhibition opening date is fixed. Menus are sorted. He has to get there. And then Rochinante starts breaking down often more and more. The machine starts falling apart. And his Blog entries in the last 15 days or so of the journey are completely matter of fact. Then I tried to find a mechanic, then the spokes fell apart, then you know, it is, it is just complete drudgery, one foot in front of the other, sheer dogged determination, somehow or the other, I need to complete these kilometers and get to Shanghai. So, in, in that sense, the, the, the limits, his own limits have been tested. They have been exceeded. Um, and he is exhausted at the end. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to a, an extraordinary lecture. We are very grateful. And there's a, another life to this. <laughs>